Father, I thank you that you have brought John and Amanda here and that you have given them as gifts to this body and what gifts they have already been to us. We do pray that in the remaining years they have here, we would pour into them faithfully and that your spirit would be at work in their hearts to shape and form their character, uh, to give them abilities, to give them experiences, to give them knowledge that they will need to go forth uh, to whatever field you have called them so that they may serve faithfully in the fulfillment of Christ's command to make disciples of all nations. For our desire is that King Jesus would be exalted among every nation on earth and that the fulfillment of your plan f uh, from before the world began to unite all things in him would come to pass. And so whatever part uh, John and Amanda have in that, we pray you'd prepare them for it. We ask tonight that our hearts would be open, that you'd anoint our brother to speak, that your word may go forth in power. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles with me, uh, turn with me to Galatians 5, 16 through 24. Galatians 5, starting with verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. When I was a kid, I loved playing at my friend Chris's house. Now, he had a big house, he had a huge yard with large trees, um, but the one thing I'll always remember about his house is that right across the street there's these train tracks and I loved trains growing up, and we weren't next to a train, but he was. And so every time a train would come by, I would stop and watch the train go by and try to count how many cars. Well, one day we were playing out in the front yard, and I noticed something about this train. It was long, um, but there was something odd about it. And I kept thinking, thinking, we just kept playing, and finally it came to me. And was like, I got it. That train's going backwards. And he stopped me. He's like, no, no, John. You don't understand. Trains don't go backwards. I was like, adamant, this train's going backwards. We waited, we watched, and lo and behold, the engine passed by us, going backwards. We couldn't believe it. But then I wondered, how did I notice that? What was so different about this train? Well, the answer is that it was going the different direction. See, Chris had just assumed that trains just all go one way, you know, left to right. But this train was going in the opposite direction. And we both realized that, you know, really, train track's not a one-way street. It goes both ways. And just like that train track, I think this text that we have this evening shows Paul is arguing that there are two ways we can live our life. There's a path of sin in the flesh and the path of the Spirit in righteousness. But I don't think it's as simple as picking which path we have to choose. There's a little more complication to that. I remember as a kid always wanting to be perfect. I tried to be a star student. I tried to be a stud athlete. I even tried to be the stand-up puppeteer. Our church had a really decent uh, puppet ministry back in the day. But everything I wanted to do, I wanted to do with excellence. But I quickly found out that was impossible. I failed tests. I cost my team on huge plays. I messed up the timing with the puppets. It was embarrassing. And I would often feel shame, and I would feel guilt, and I would just stay up at night wondering, why did I mess up? I could have done better. I didn't think those feelings could get any worse. 
Then I encountered sin and learned that as a Christian, as a human being, I'm required holy living to be perfect before God. And those sins would also keep me up at night. There would be evenings where I would sit in bed and weep and wonder, why did I mess up again? This is the same sin over and over. Am I really saved? What confidence do I have? Why do I keep failing God who saved me? I think the answer to the questions I had back then and for those of us who have them still today, is in this text. Specifically, I think that we can see that though inward conflict temporarily exists, the Holy Spirit empowers believers to walk in righteousness and is a guarantee of Christ's final victory. I think the structure of this text can be seen in the main exhortation at the beginning of the passage. Walk by the Spirit. Paul then lays out the purpose and nature of this command as he quickly contrasts it with the flesh and its desires. In doing so, he sets up two alternate paths, one that is empowered by the flesh and its desires, and the other that is empowered by the desires of the Spirit. So we'll do three things. First, we'll look at how Paul sets up this dichotomy. Then, we'll look at the path of the flesh. What makes it distinct? How can we tell what the path of the flesh is? And where is it heading? And finally, we'll look at the path of the Spirit, noting how it differs from the path of the flesh and how we can be on it. So number one, there are two opposite paths people can walk. There are two opposite paths people can walk. We can look at verse 17. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Paul explicitly makes clear that the Spirit and flesh are incompatible. Well, what is our conflict over? The conflict is over how we live our lives. The Spirit pulls one direction towards holiness. The flesh pulls in the opposite direction towards selfish desires, towards living a life that is contrary to the will of God. This verse reveals that believers can and do have inner conflict in the present age. This is why we cannot coast towards holiness. It takes effort to pray, to regularly study scripture, to love our neighbor. These are things that won't happen simply just by us waking up in the morning. We have to try and attempt to do these things because there is a fleshly nature within ourselves that is wanting the contrary. Well, why is this the case? Was it always this way? Well, no. When God created man and woman, he declared everything good. Well, what went wrong? Let's briefly examine Paul's argument in Romans 1, 21 through 25, to see why the flesh and its desires are opposed with the Spirit. He writes, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. Paul gives a clear image of what sin has done to corrupt our flesh, fleshly nature. We have traded worshiping God for worshiping idols. We have traded living for the Creator for living for creation. Instead of living a life that gives glory straight to God, everything we do is bent towards other things. The goal of sin is to bend every action, every word, every thought towards self absorption and ultimately self-destruction, there is one word that can sum up what the flesh does. Me. That is all the flesh is concerned about. It is about me, me, me. That is why it's contrary to the Spirit because the Spirit is leading us towards God and giving glory to our Creator. Because of this, 
our sinful nature leads us to sinful desires, sinful behavior, sinful habits. And in this reality, we are under the law, and therefore we are under condemnation. We see reference to the law in verse 18, and in, Corinth, and in Galatians, commentator Paul Schrenner notes that to be under the law is to be under a curse, or under sin, or under a custodian, under guardians and managers, enslaved under the elements of this world, and in need of redemption. This is the common theme in Galatians, and in every sense is negative connotation. But in contrast to the flesh, which is under the law, and therefore under the condemnation of God, the spirit is free from the law, and therefore free from condemnation. Notice the language in verse 18. If you are led by the spirit. Let's pause. The spirit is not an impersonal force that gives us power to live righteously. It is a person. He is an active guide who influences our lives. But where is this guy that's leading? The result is freedom from the law. Remember that those apart from the Spirit are under the law and therefore condemnation. But those who live their life by the path of the Spirit are not under this condemnation because they're free from the law. The reason for this, as we will see later, is that the Spirit comes as a result in faith in Christ. The Christ who has fulfilled the law the Christ who we place our faith in, the Christ who we are in and united to, that is where we find our freedom. But before we get there, let's look at the path of the flesh. Point two, the path of the flesh. Paul begins this section by giving a long list of vices. And I think we can group these sins into three categories. Sins against the body, sins against trusting God, and sins against our neighbor. First, Sins against the body. Notice that Paul begins his list with three references to sexual sins and ends the list with one. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, and orgies. The fact that Paul lists multiple items to condemn sexual immorality displays how wide and pervasive it is. He could have just simply said sexual immorality and that would have covered all these issues. But the fact of the matter is this sin in particular is so wide and pervasive that there are multiple terms that we can identify. And the fact is, Paul, Paul's list could have gone on and on and on. I think it's important to note also that, in particular, sexual sins are against one's body. Listen to Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, 18-20. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexual and moral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. There is one form of sexual immorality I want to condemn specifically tonight. Um, it's the sin of pornography. About a month ago, I heard on the news that the famous magazine Playboy would no longer be publishing the explicit pictures they're so famous for promoting. At first I was shocked. You know, this is wonderful news. Um, this, this is clearly answered to prayer, but I looked closer at the, the story and I realized that this is not a good news. In fact, this is horrible news. The reason they're stopping is because the industry that they help produce and make and create has outgrown them. They've moved past them. The internet has surpassed Playboy magazine to the point where Playboy no one can profit from producing what it used to produce. The fact of the matter is that pornography is more secretive, more graphic, and more pervasive than any point in world history. But what's the, what, what was really the issue with pornography exactly? Now, I'm not hurting anybody. Um, now it's a private matter. Um, you know, it can be considered an art form. Um, what, what exactly is the issue of pornography, really? No one's going to know. Those are the thoughts that the flesh will constantly use to satisfy its desires. Make no mistake, the flesh will use even valid points and questions to satisfy what it wants to do. But we must respond by turning and grounding ourselves in the Word of God. This text is helpful, but let's also consider Matthew 5, 27-29, where Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You should not commit adultery. 
But I say to you that everyone who lusts with the woman, with lustful intent, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. If we are to turn away from looking at these images, where are we supposed to look at? I think the answer is Christ. We need, must turn our gaze to Christ. Consider Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. My brothers and sisters, the unrepentant perpetual gaze of this sinful earthly pleasure will rob you of this sight. Make no mistake, there is forgiveness in Christ. For those who repent and place their faith in Christ, there is forgiveness of the sin. And you are freed to run from it. So run! Do not let this temporary pleasure blind you in eternity. If this is an area of struggle, or you simply want forms of accountability so you don't ever enter into it, I encourage you to talk to me, one of the pastors. Cornerstone has bought access for us to cheaply set up accountability over our phones and internet browsers. This is something that's worth fighting against and it's worth pursuing because eternity is at stake. The second category is sins against trusting God. Idolatry and sorcery both fit into this category. Some may wonder if these are sins still, Christians still struggle with today. I mean, after all, you know, who believes in magic or silly idols anymore? But let's not be too quick in assuming that we are superior to the Christians in Galatia. In fact, we too are idolaters. Remember what Paul said in Romans 1? That idolatry is the result of worshiping creatures rejecting God. We are still creatures oriented to worship, so when we stop worshiping God, we have to worship something else, creation. Every rejection of God leads to a replacement of God. Everyone worships something, often in line with the cultural values and beliefs of the day. But an idol is something of ultimate purpose and gives our life meaning. So what do we do? Like sexual morality, we must flee from it and turn our trust from our money or our family or our job to God. We know that our faith is in Him and that because of that, we have our identity in Him. The third category, sins against the neighbor. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, and envy fit into this category. Strife, gossip, and fits of anger do not at first seem as serious as sexual immorality or murder or even idolatry. But they are just as, if not more, destructive. Some conflict is healthy, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. But the type of conflict Paul is describing is vicious in nature. These, again, are characterized by the flesh. And so it's not concerned about the w loving the other person, but it's more concerned about being right, being put in a position where I am exalted or I am vindicated. Strife in particular, I've experienced to be destructive in communities, even among believers. Um, when I was in high school, I was part of a debate club, a homeschool Christian debate league. And we were in Memphis, and we went around the South to these different tournaments. And we got a new coach who the best way to explain him is like the Karate Kid mentor. We would do all this different stuff that didn't seem to anything to do with policy debate. And then we would go to these tournaments and do amazing. But the parents, some parents, hated the unorthodox style. So even though we were learning things that applied to more than policy debate, they wanted us to focus on the evidence and the issues instead of whatever we were doing in there. Um, one day, after the meeting, we were discussing, and Coach loved to meet with us students and encourage us and you know, be you know, 
one of us. And so we would joke and do different stuff. Well, one night, he says a joke that wasn't to anyone, but a student took it on him and his family. And he told his parents, and they became quickly offended and left the group. And with them, there were several families who were threatening to leave the group unless he resigned. So the coach quickly calls. Um, the father apologizes, asks for forgiveness, asks for opportunity to repent among his, in front of his family. Um, but the father rejects both offers. Um, he says, you are more concerned about looking good in front of these kids than actual repentance and doing what's right. Um, whether or not the father is right, I don't know. But that was the case. And that decision led to a meeting where we all had to decide whether we continue to have coach or not as our, as our leader. And I heard parent after parent come up and explain how foolish it was to continue to have him as our leader, how he was not helping us at all. And I never realized how angry I could be, but I've realized that when people criticize the people I love and care about, I'm quickly angered. And that anger gives me such focus where I can go point by point by point and defend the person I love. And that's what I did. I went point by point showing how their arguments were faulty, showing how he needs to stay, how this whole situation is a mess. All of it was pointless, unbeknownst to all of us. See, Coach, he wasn't there, but he had written a letter to be read at the beginning, and it wasn't read till near the end. And in it, he explained how he wanted reconciliation far more than any position that he had. And because that he, his position was ruining the trust, the camaraderie in our group, and because he wanted reconciliation with this family so much, he resigned, and he never joined the club again. If he hadn't done that, this was right before regionals and then nationals, our group would have not done well at all. There were students who were struggling because their parents were against coach but were for coach. There were other students who didn't have a clue and there were, was a lot of debating even just on this issue. But his decision to resign united us and we did so well. I struggled for weeks forgiving the people who vilified coach but I forgave them because he forgave them. And I realized that the only reason Coach could do that, and he said this in the letters, because Christ had forgiven him. And that ultimately, strife is about the flesh. And even when we find ourselves in positions that feel like God's calling us to be at, it's more important to forgive and seek reconciliation among believers than any position or organization. So what then does the flesh lead to then? If these are the marks of the flesh of sexual morality, idolatry, strife, where then is the destination? I think we can look and find it in verse 21. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why does, this, why does Paul use this language of inheritance? Well, I think we can look back at what we said um, when he read Galatians 4, 3 through 7, specifically verse 7. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God. Those who walk by the flesh do not have the set of them. They are still a slave. They are not a son. They are not an heir in the kingdom of God. This is why no one can, needs to teach a person how to sin. It's a natural result of who we are. No one taught me how to lie, and yet I still lied. No one taught me how to steal, and yet I still stole. No one taught me how to be prideful, and yet I'm still prideful. So this is the destiny of those in the flesh, which is everyone, as Romans 1 argues, that everyone rejects God, goes their own way. This is the destiny of mankind. This is the one-way track that me and my friend Chris thought there was. How can trains go backwards? How can we go the other way? That is the path of the Spirit, which is point three, the path of the Spirit. In contrast with the works of the flesh, there is the fruit of the Spirit. In this fruit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
There are several observations to make about the fruit of the Spirit, but we will focus on just three tonight. First, the fruit of the Spirit is unified. When you walk by the Spirit, you will have love and kindness and self-control and patience and so on. You will not have some aspects apart from others. This is why the world can appear to have the fruit of the Spirit. There are peaceful, kind atheists who didn't have real peace in their lives. There are many peaceful Buddhists in the world who didn't have the love of God in them. This is why the fruit of the Spirit is unique, is that the world cannot offer anything as complete and unified as the Spirit is. Second, the fruit of the Spirit is inward. In contrast with the works of the flesh, the attributes of the fruit are things of character. It's not simply doing the right thing. It's doing things the right way. The fruit of the Spirit affects your job, your school, your relationships. You cannot hide the fruit of the Spirit. It simply wells out from you who you are. And yet, I think it's often hidden from us. I know myself that I don't feel very patient most of the time. I don't feel like I have self-control. But people have encouraged me and said, no, you've, I've seen you grow in patience. I've seen you grow in love and gentleness. I think that's one way as we as brothers and sisters in Christ can encourage and love one another by pointing out, hey, I've seen God work in you and then growing the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And that encourages me. So that's one way we can do this. But doesn't that build up pride? Isn't there a danger in that? Well, no, because the third point is that the fruit of the Spirit is given. There is no earthly means to produce the fruit of the Spirit in ourselves. It is a direct gift from God. And one of the beautiful things about this gift is that it confirms our adoption and inheritance in God's kingdom. Listen to Paul in Ephesians 1, verses 13 through 14. In him also... When you heard the word of truth, the God of your, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit is the confirming agent by which we can know God's promises are true. We know that God will accept us at Christ's return because he's given us his Holy Spirit. And we know that he has given us his Holy Spirit by his fruit in our lives. That's why encouragement is so powerful. It's because it's reminding us that, yes, you have the Holy Spirit in you. I can see the fruit in your life. And because you have the Holy Spirit in you, you are in Christ. And if you're in Christ, you will be with the Father. Final judgment. How then do we receive the Spirit? Let's look back at verse 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Now, let's think for a second. Why is Paul speaking in the past tense of the death of the flesh and its desires? He just mentioned before the walk by the Spirit, and you'll not satisfy the desires of the flesh. In fact, there's a isn't there a present conflict between the two? Isn't the flesh crucified? Well, how can it still be conflicting with the, the Holy Spirit in your, in your life? Well, I think the way we understand it is that Paul is reminding us of sin's final victory, which has been secured through to those in Christ Jesus. Placing your faith in Christ crucifies your flesh in an ultimate and final way. Because of this ultimate assurance, we are to live accordingly, walk by the Spirit. Again, to see it another way, let's look at Romans 8.13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live, if by the Spirit you put to death deeds of the body, you will live. There is a present imperative for believers to walk by the Holy Spirit. Yet, we can rest assured knowing that God has empowered us to do so by that very same Holy Spirit. Again, this is a command. This is an imperative for us to live out today. But we can rest assured knowing that when I place my faith in Christ, I am sealed with the Holy Spirit. 
as Anthony Hokema excellently wrote, a person in Christ is a person who has decisively and irrevocably put off the old self and put on the new self, and who must continually and progressively be renewed in the spirit or attitude of his or her mind. A once for all change of direction is to be accomplished by daily progressive renewal. I'll conclude with one final illustration. In high school, my mom, sister, and I had an important event at a church, and the church was a little far away, and often we would go this back way. It was actually by my friend Chris's house, and as the problem was, you would guess, is that the train tracks, we'd have to cross over, and sometimes there would be a train, and we'd be delayed, and it wasn't actually a shortcut. Um, so we were late one time, and we took the shortcut, and lo and behold, there was a train, except this, this was the worst case. Uh, it was stopped. So not only does there traffic stop behind us because of the train, there's top, traffic stopped in front of us, and there's no escape until that train moves. So we wait and wait, and finally, I, I can't really believe it, but it starts moving. But it's so slow. It's no faster than a snail. I, I, my, my life was flashing before my eyes. Like, I have to be at this meeting. And slowly, passed. And then one car passed. Then the second car. And I started noticing it was picking up, but it was still taking forever. And then it really started getting faster. And then I could count the cars. And finally, I couldn't count them anymore. And then it was gone. And believe it or not, we actually made it on time. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> but I think that picture helps us in that just like that train, it was moving, even though it was taking such a long time, our growth can seem like that to us as well. Our growth can seem minuscule. It seems like it's taking forever. But remember, it's what's the destination? That train's destination was confirmed by its direction. It was going that way. It was going to get there at a slow pace or a fast pace. And often, as we mature and grow in the Christian walk, our pace of growth grows as well. But ultimately, that's not the focus of it. Whether I'm maturing in patience and love as fast as I can or not, what matters is that it's cured in Christ. And this growth does require our active participation. But again, we just remember that it's secured in Christ so that I can actively pursue it. If you find yourself thinking about the path of the flesh, it's like, I really feel like that's where I am. I'm not characterized by the fruit of the Spirit. I'm not characterized by those things. But I really find myself aligned with the path of the flesh. I do exhort you to repent there is no hope outside of Christ. These feelings of guilt or conviction are actually the work of God in you, calling you home. If you want to know how to put your faith in Christ, what does repentance look like? Talk to me or even your neighbor after this. Because this matters. This truly matters. If you are a believer tonight, Remember that we are no longer slaves to sin, but we are adopted sons of God. With that, we have a new freedom. We no longer have to obey the desires of the flesh, but we are free to walk by the Spirit. So let us go and live out this new identity, following the Holy Spirit step by step. And let us also encourage one another and love on one another in doing this. May Christ be with you. May the grace of God also be with you. You are dismissed.